Welcome to everyone, especially welcome our friends from Berean Assembly. Yes. Uh, Pastor Neo and family and friends. Huh? Are they here? Neo. Thought I saw his name. Neo and Tim. Pastor Neo, Auntie Ng. Yeah. Willy, Sister Kiluan. Welcome, everybody. So, Doctor, how are you? Okay. Good. Busy, 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 yeah? Oh, uh, this week was busy. This week, I don't know how I end up with three sermons. <laughs> Apart from the weekly. Oh, I... <laughs> so, two have to be uh, pre recorded and then uh, sent off to the churches, and then the third one, I'll have to do a physical one on Sunday. Mm -hmm. But it was, uh, well, interesting in the sense that three different churches, one is uh, Basel Church in uh, Sabah, of course, then Grace, uh, Batapahat, and then the third one is actually a Matoma Church. So, quite interesting. What? Indian Matoma. Church? Matoma is... Uh, Orthodox. Mm. So they claim to start from uh, St. Thomas. Mm -mm. It's a very old church from India. Yeah, we, we heard of that in Batu too. Yeah. Yeah. So, so my first time there, so it will be interesting. Evening. Evening. Hi, everybody. Okay. We have uh, two minutes more. Good to see all of you. Good to be able to attend. <laughs> Hello, Daniel. We have some Hi, how are you? From Berean Assembly, welcome, friends from Berean Assembly. Thank you, thank you. And uh, here is Pastor Neo, who is the student of Dr. So Dr. very always very uh <laughs> when he hears that he's coming. <laughs> thank you for joining us tonight. We postponed our prayer meeting just at that. Yeah, you are, that's why I was so touch. <laughs> Okay, we shall almost eight o'clock. Let's all begin with the word of prayer, shall we? Let's pray. Lord, our Father, we are so thankful tonight that we can gather from far and near, even separated by distance. We can be together as a family. We thank you for this privilege of gathering around your word. Above all, we thank you for your revelation through your word to us that we may know you better. And we thank you for those who have uh, sacrificed much, even life and limb, to bring your word to us down the ages. And we're thankful tonight that we have uh, Dr. Anthony Locke with us. We thank you that you have raised up people like him who have committed their lives to study your word and to teach it. So Lord, we pray for your presence tonight with every one of us may be able to take home uh, something from you, from you, hear personally from you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Welcome, uh, Doctor. We are very privileged to have him as uh, we, we heard just now he's so busy that he has got three sermons this week. Uh, for this particular slot in his calendar, I have to book him last year. So to hear him next year, the book this year. To hear him this year, must book last year. Why is he so busy? Because he wears many hats. He's a researcher, lecturer, author, preacher. So many things. And of course, he's well-trained in theology. He has been ordained as a minister of the Methodist Church. 
I will not ask you why it's the past tense, <laughs> but uh, thank you for coming to us tonight. He has a PhD in Old Testament from the University of Wales and a whole string of other degrees which I shall not bore you with. Tonight he shall be teaching us on Ezekiel. You know, when you think of Ezekiel, it's quite a, a book that overwhelms us for all 48 chapters of it. Um, to me, it's, it's, more, it's, it's as awesome as Revelation. And we remember he came to teach us Revelation as well. In Revelation, as well as in Ezekiel, we can get a bit overwhelmed by all the language, the visions and things, a lot of things that we don't understand. But thanks to people like him, we shall be able to understand a little bit more. So, Dr. Anthony Lock, take it away. Okay, so let me see. What, what time do I have? 8 to 9.30. Okay, sure. Okay, so we are looking at the book of Ezekiel. Uh, I think many of us, um, as Billy says, can be overwhelmed by some of these long books, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel. 48 chapters is not easy to read. Especially when you come to those chapters from chapter 4 to 32, there's a lot of repetition. Uh, a lot of things are actually saying the same things, but again, repeated in many ways. So uh, one can get stuck actually reading through a book like Ezekiel. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to spend two weekends. So first weekend is uh, tonight, and then the next weekend will be in the second half of the year. And then we will cover this whole book. So tonight we will focus on only the first 32 chapters and then uh, the reason is very simple because this deal with oracles of judgment and then from 33 to 48 we will leave it for the second half of the year when we finish up the second part of the book so if you were to let's say let's let's start off by maybe you can switch on your mind if you want now what comes to your mind when you think of the the prophet ezekiel immediately what comes to your mind when you hear the name ezekiel when I was young, I remember reading Ezekiel. The first thing that came to mind was crazy guy. You know, he, he do all these crazy things. You know, shave off his hair, bow up, then divide up the hair, and then one third he burned the hair, one third he chopped the hair with a knife, and then one third he sew and hit the, the hair in the helm of his garment. You know, only crazy people do things like this. <laughs> so for me, when I think of Ezekiel, I always think about the crazy things he does. Um, the wife passed away. And he didn't turn up for the funeral. I mean, funeral is supposed to be the last time you ever see your loved one before they're buried. And he just disappeared. And when everything was over, he then turned up. And uh, you know, of course, people just couldn't understand this crazy man. What else comes to your mind when you think of Ezekiel? I would say he will also be very privileged because he's one of those who actually saw God. Like Isaiah in chapter 6, in a temple, he saw God sitting on the throne and God's rope filled the whole temple. I know. Jeremiah didn't seem to have that vision, but many times he saw many things that God shows him. But Ezekiel was one of those who saw God's presence. And we find it in the first three chapters. To see God and live, that is really amazing. Like Moses, able to see God on Mount Sinai and yet live to tell. So I think on one hand, we are privileged to, to have encountered God. And yet, if ever you want to be a prophet, I would probably say, well, pick one of those minor prophets, maybe easier. Uh, the three major prophets all didn't have a very good end. You know, Jeremiah uh, died in exile in Egypt. Isaiah, Jewish tradition says he was arrested as an old man by the young king Manasseh and he was found hiding in a hollow tree lock. So the king ordered the soldiers to saw the prophet into half. You know, like what you see in those magic tricks, he saw a person into half, but this one is he's supposed to die. And Ezekiel died in exile probably in Babylon and never returned home to his homeland and to see Jerusalem. So, well, for all his faithfulness, preaching for about 22 years, 
uh, he wasn't rewarded in the end with a trip back home. He died in an unclean land in Babylon. So when we want, <laughs> when we want to become like a prophet, think again if you ever want to be like an easy kill. Okay. It's not an easy uh, position to be in. As you said, the book has 48 chapters. Uh, navigating through the chapters is often difficult because it's, it's like you go to visit a foreign country and you have no head, no tail, what's going on, what you're going to see. Uh, you know, it's just like we said, Mong Cha Cha, you just go there blindly, you know, and, and, and very often you get confused over places. One way to work through is if you can have a skeleton or a simple structure like what I propose, then it's easier to actually understand the book and maybe even remember. So a uh, structure will be like a skeleton, an outline. That will be quite useful. So we often tend to divide it this way, one to three. And then four to 32 are all the oracles of judgment. 33 to 48 are all the oracles of hope and deliverance. So these are negative and these are more positive. So, so remember it this way, three blocks of material. The first three chapters are his calling. They detail what he saw and what did God do and commission him or the soul be on the tree. 432 have two parts. They are basically negative in their message. They are all judgment oracles. The first half, which is quite long, 4 to 24, it's about 21 chapters, is directed against his own people. Okay, very interesting. Very often we think that when we want to school, uh, no, we will probably school other people. But here he actually scolded his own people because they deserve the punishment. They have gone to exile in Babylon. They all thought God will quickly bring them home. Well, Ezekiel says no, because God needs to judge you guys and uh, you, know, you, you need to experience this because you, you have sinned against God. So 21 chapters. Then let people say God is unfair. God only judges his own people. Then what about foreign nations? Uh, they also sin against God. So here we find you have about eight chapters that deals with the foreign nations. So he starts off with judgment against his own people, but he doesn't forget about the foreign nations. So we use the phrase OAN, Oracles Against Nation. So that is a nice, nice acronym, standard acronym that we often use, Oracles Against Nation. To remind us that all those nations that surrounded Judah, some of them were allies, they promised help, and then they didn't turn up when, when they need to. Others betrayed Judah, and uh, while Babylon was destroying Jerusalem, Judah, these nations laugh at Judah. So you find that some of these foreign nations and the city states are singled out for judgment as well. God says, I will judge you. So think about Malaysia. We live in ASEAN and we're surrounded by all the nations around us, Singapore, Indonesia, Philippines, Thailand, Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia. And in a way, you no know, God's judgment also includes those nations around so that if they sin against God, they do all these um, evil things, God will also judge them just as God judges his own people. So you have a two-part thing here. One, both are negative, one against his own people, one against the foreign nations. And then at 33, that is the pivotal chapter. That is the chapter when we find that he swings from negative to positive. You know, it's like a hinge, a pivot. Here he swings over, and the rest of these chapters, which is about 16 chapters, he focused on hope, salvation, deliverance. So these are all the positive messages. And so it is inside here, you find that wonderful chapter in 37, the valley of the dry bones. You also find uh, visions of a new temple that God will rebuild in the future. So the last set of uh, chapters, those uh, 16 chapters are more positive. So this is the easiest way to remember. Just think of three parts. One to three is calling. Four to 32, all the negative preaching. First half to his own people, second half to the foreign nations. And then the last part, the third section, are all the positive preaching, all the oracles of hope and salvation. Now that's a very easy way to remember. Uh, it's very generalized, but of course, it, uh, in detail, some things will be a little bit not so exact 
but I think it's a good way to navigate. So that's how I teach people. I just finished teaching eight weeks of uh, ECQ to a Baptist church in uh, KL. And uh, we literally have time to work through in that. But this is the easiest structure, I told them, easiest way to remember. 1 to 3, 4 to 32, 33 to 48. So let's begin by looking at the man, Ezekiel. What can we glean about this guy? Well, we know we are told he was probably a priest. And his father's name is mentioned in chapter 1, verse 3. Ezekiel, the priest, the son of Buzi. Well, apart from knowing the name Buzi, we don't know much about the father. But in ancient times, it was important to know the father's name because that was actually part of your name. Uh, it is like the melee, they, they use one name plus the father's name. So Ezekiel ben Buzi, that's what it means. So son of is the Hebrew word ben. And so you find the name will be Ezekiel ben Buzi. So there's so many Ezekiels around, but which Ezekiel are we talking about? The one who is the son of the father. So sometimes Ezekiel will simply be called ben Buzi, son of Buzi. So remember the story of uh, Ben-Hur. Ben-Hur was a movie that was made from this book. And Ben-Hur's name was actually Judah. Judah Ben-Hur. Miss Her was her father's name, H U R, but his real name was Judah. But sometimes people don't even call him Judah, they just call him Ben Her, the means son of her. So that's how the Hebrew people think about. So the father's name is important. So here they remember the father's name, Ezekiel, son of Buzi. And probably we know that priests are hereditary. It is a position where you're born into the family line and you become a priest. You don't like today become a pastor. Uh, from any uh, corner of society, you know, any body can become a pastor. But in the old days, you can't be a priest unless you're born into a priestly line. So therefore, if your father was a priest, you will be a priest. If your grandfather was a priest, surely your father and you will be a priest. So it's hereditary. So, well, like it or not, sometimes if you're born, you, be, you, you have to continue this line. So we know he was a priest, but he was an exiled priest because he was exiled to Babylon together with the rest of the people in the first deportation. Altogether, we think that there were three deportations. That means when Babylon came and defeated the nation of Judah, the first time round, they did not totally subdue and conquer and destroy the city. They allowed the city to well remain as it was, but they deported about 10% of the population. And the 10% are usually the cream of the society. So the 10% are all the top people, the intelligentsia. Who are the 10%? Obviously the king of Judah, the royal court, the royal family, royal officials who serve the king, and then people who are skilled, so craftsmen who can uh, do missionary work and all this, and then priests who are often trained to be literate, or so they've taken along. So 10% of the population was carried off in exile together with the king, and there was Jehoiakim. And among them, because priests were exiled, among them we think was Ezekiel. So in the year 597, there was a first deportation, he already went to Babylon. So Babylon is here. And you can look at the map. Babylon is right at the bottom of the two rivers, Euphrates and Tigris. Judah is actually here, Jerusalem. So they had to take him all the way up, follow what is called the Fatal Crescent Route, and all the way to Babylon. You don't go across like this person is through the desert. I don't you can survive in the desert. So they follow the rivers, so they go up north and then swing back down south. A total of maybe about 1,200 miles journey. So exile to Babylon in this year together with 10% of the cream of the population. So vocation, out of job priest. Now I can identify with him. <laughs> Ezekiel, out of job. I mean, it's like you, you spend your lifetime training from youth to be ready to be a priest and then pop, that's it. You are taken out of the context, transferred to Babylon, and because in Babylon there's no Jewish temple. So no Jewish temple in Babylon, then there is no way you can serve. So you are out of our job. And the government take you there. Well, some of them ended up in the civil service, like Daniel and the three friends, Abed, Shabbat, and Abednego. Others end up, well, maybe working in the military. 
others also became farmers because you need to feed the empire. So we know he became a farmer at a river Kebab. River Kebab is probably one of those irrigation canals drawing water from the Euphrates, Tigris to irrigate the fields because it's a very dry desert area. Okay. So he was there in his place, out of job and working as a farmer. So for a few years, nothing happened. He just became a farmer and he worked. Then one day, God appeared to him here in Babylon. No longer back in uh, Jerusalem where the temple used to be, but God has somehow come to where Babylon, where all the exiles are. And God appeared to him and then God called him to be to do two things, a double vocation. Okay. The double vocation has a uh, very powerful significance because each of the vocation deals with one aspect. So first, we were, we were told in chapter 2 verse 5, God called him to be a prophet. So God says, the people are imprudent and stubborn and I send them to send you to them, and you shall say to them, Thus says the Lord God, and whether they hear or refuse to hear, for they are rebellious house, they will know that there has been a prophet among them. So God sent him first as a prophet. So what is a prophet? Who is a prophet? A prophet is simply God's mouthpiece. Or you can say God's loudspeaker. You know, you are the mouthpiece of God. You speak on God's behalf. So what God tells you, and then you just pass on that word. So that was his first vocation. And then in the next chapter in chapter 3 verse 17, you find that there's a second vocation which will be reaffirmed in chapter 33 again later. This second vocation is now to be a watchman, chapter 3 verse 17. And at the end of seven days, after that vision that he encountered, the word of God came to him and said, Son of man, I have made you a watchman for the house of Israel. So, and a watchman basically is one who climbs out a watchtower and is supposed to give warning to the people. If the enemy approaches the city, the watchman sounds the alarm, blow the shofar, you know, and the people will know this. So he had a double vocation, to be a mouthpiece and to be one who warns people. And you'll see the first part of the book, he will be basically doing a part of the prophet. So in chapters 4 all the way to 32, that was his vocation. Speaking God's words of judgment. And then from 33, he then swing over to this second vocation onwards and to be a watchman to tell the people what God will do in the future and how they can avoid all the mistakes of the past and get themselves ready. And he cannot fail here as a watchman. Okay, so double vocation, very interesting. So next time, it's possible to have a double vocation to be two things at one time. Okay. So his ministry was to people who were also exiled in Babylon. Sometimes we think, uh, was Ezekiel actually back home in Jerusalem and then writing all these long letters uh, to people in exile? No, he wasn't in, in Jerusalem. He was in Babylon together with fellow exiles. That means he is not an armchair theologian as we often argue. You know, some people uh, write about mission. They talk about the mission of the church and all this. But they're all writing from their nice acorn office, you know, in a nice first world country. And they're talking about mission and all this. To me, sometimes that is what you call an armchair theologian. You are not out in the field, not there where the people is. You are not at what we call ground zero to be where the people are. And very often you write from the safety and comfort of your home, your, your career, your loved ones, your family, your country. No, he wasn't an armchair theologian. He was one of the exiles, ministering to exiles. He was there. And in a way, sometimes it's a reminder to us, sometimes... God wants us to be out there, not in our ivory towers. Very often, I think we Christians are often middle class Christians. And we often hide in our ivory towers. So that was one of the reasons why when birthday tree came, I told my family, I'm going to go out into the streets and walk the streets to be where the people is. And I picked the hottest place you can ever go to in KL, 
Jalan Masjid Jamek. <laughs> that is always the hottest place. That's very near the uh, Dataran Medica. And true enough, and that's where they fire the tear gas at 3 p.m. So sometimes you have to go down right to where the people are and walk the talk. Okay? Not just talk, but walk the talk. And so he was one of those who walked the talk. He was there in exile. So when he's telling the people, I understand your pain, I understand your nostalgia for home, for Jerusalem, he is not writing from safety and comfort, he is there. But his audience, many times God already told him, they are a rebellious house. They are stiff-necked and stubborn. These are two terms used to describe the Israelites when they first came out of Egypt. You know, when I think about the, the when I think about the generation of, of God's people who came out from Egypt, they are one of the most blessed. Why? Because they saw God fighting with Pharaoh through the ten plagues. They were the ones who saw God split the Red Sea and cross the Red Sea. They were the ones who tasted manna, bread from heaven. They were the ones who, who drank water whenever Moses struck the rock with his staff. They saw all these miracles, and yet the Bible describes them stiff neck and stubborn. And here, after you can say 700 years of living in the promised land, the people are still stiff neck and stubborn. They have not obeyed God, and that was one of the reasons why God had to turn down them to exile. God had to kick them to exile because they were just slow to believe. You know, like some of us sometimes slow to believe, slow to respond, slow to believe. And those who went to exile are also those who have sinned against God. Look at the preaching of the Proverbs from the 8th century, 7th century, 6th century, from Isaiah, from Micah, from Amos, from Hosea, from Habakkuk, Joel, Jonah, Jer Jeremiah, all these Proverbs preached against these people. And these, all these people have sinned against God. They were reaping what they sowed. That was, a, that was the audience of his message. Now imagine sometimes when you ask God, make me a prof, I want to be a prophet, you know, uh, think again. Sometimes God sends you to an audience like this. You know, as a pastor, I, I, I had served 32 years in the ministry, in the pastoral ministry. In the 32 years, I went to all the five regional districts in Malaysia, in West Malaysia. We, we divide our, the country into five districts, Northern District, Perak District, Selangor Central District, Southern District, Eastern District. I have served in all five districts as a pastor. Then in about 32 years, I've been to churches which are sometimes very, very difficult churches. We pastors have a, have a nickname for those churches. We call them graveyard churches. Because pastors can literally die while serving there in those churches. Uh, I have seen, I have been to two of those churches. I thank God I survived. I didn't, I didn't, didn't literally die. And it's not easy sometimes when you have an audience like this. And that was in my second church when I was serving. You know, after preaching a, ser a sermon on Sunday and you feel, sometimes you feel good, on Monday you find in your post box little love letters from your church members. You know, they will drop in little notes, Pastor, I don't like your sermon. Pastor, I think you're preaching about me. <laughs> you will drop little notes there into your post box. I used to get very depressed reading those notes. You know, sometimes it's like that. There are people are not, they're not people who welcome you. Thank you, you know, Ezekiel for your message. No, they are stiff-necked, stubborn, slow to respond and believe. You know, Ezekiel spent almost seven years preaching those oracles of judgment. And it took the people so long to finally come to the senses that he was actually preaching the truth. In fact, Ezekiel was only vindicated in chapter 33 when a man came running from Jerusalem carrying the news, Jerusalem has fallen. And then only the people realized, yeah, this crazy guy has been telling us the truth the last seven years. And we find it so hard to believe. That was the audience he was called to. Okay. So what was his task? If we are called to a stiff neck, stub stubborn, slow to respond to our audience, and they're all fellow exiles in Babylon, well, his task was simply this. Guys, God is not going to end the exile quickly. There's no quick end to the exile. We're going to be here on long haul. Long haul means what? You're going to put down your roots. You're going to build houses, like what Jeremiah says. You're going to plant your gardens, your orchards. You're going to marry your children to your sons and sons to your daughters. You're going to make your best out of life, seek the welfare of the city. In doing so, 
don't lose hope in God either. You just got to hang on there. Now, that is the hardest part. How do you hang on to a faith in God when you are in exile? When everything has fallen apart, the whole world has just collapsed. How do you hang on and wait till exile is over? Exile was only over in 538. Remember, when, when was he carried to exile? 597, 10 years before the fall of Jerusalem, he was already exiled. And the exile will last until 538. It will be about 60 years. If you're already 30 years of age, six years later, you're already 90. I don't think you can probably even walk home back to Jerusalem. It's going to be a long haul. And that was a message that he had. That means some of you guys, you're not going to live long enough to go back home. So make the best. And maybe some of us, you know, when you hear a message like that, oh, it's so unfair, God is so unfair. But sometimes we may be that generation who may not see what God will do. Maybe it's our children's generation who will see God, God's hand at work. So for this rebellious generation, many of them will not go back home. Many of them will not see the second temple being rebuilt. Many of them will not experience the post-restoration period. Many of them will die in exile in a foreign polluted land. And so it's a reminder to us that not all God's people, we don't always end up with a good ending in life. Sometimes, like the prophets, they didn't end up with a good ending. The only good ending is we will still go to heaven and then in heaven maybe God will then reward us. Sometimes there are no physical rewards on this earth. Like me, many missionaries who serve in the Middle East in the 19th century, they work 30, 40 years and they sometimes don't see a single convert. Did they mean they failed? No. I think just that they didn't get to see the rewards now. Maybe the rewards will come in heaven. When they go to heaven, God will still say to them, well done, good and faithful servant. And that was, I think, what Ezekiel's life was. He never went back home. His last recorded message is in chapter 29. We can date it to 571. 571 is still a long way off from 538. After 571, we don't find him preaching anymore. And that's it. He disappeared. Okay, so that was his ministry. Not an easy but thing. So we start out in chapter 1 and 3. We're going to quickly swing through the chapters. First thing we note, very amazing, the book gives us two datings on his calling. So if you look at chapter 1 and 2, in the 30th year, in the fourth month, on the fifth day of the month, as I was among the exiles by the river Keba, the rivers were open and I saw visions of God. On the fifth day of the month, that was the fifth year of the exile of King Jehoiachin. The word of the Lord came to Ezekiel. Now we find in the two verses here, a double date. First one is in verse 1, we are told, in the 30th year, we scratch our head. What is this 30th year? Because 30th year is a very relative uh, number. 30th year of what? You must have a starting point. We think the starting point is Ezekiel's age. And the 30th year means he was 30 years of age. And Ezekiel was a priest. All priests were trained, and at the age of 30, they begin their ministry. Because 30th year is the year of adulthood. The beginning of adulthood. That means before 30, you are still considered a child, still under your parents. But at 30, you are now so-called literary and adult. Okay, and priests will begin the ministry no longer as an apprentice, but now you're on your own. So we are told in the 30th year, and we think that was Ezekiel's age. That means at the year when you're supposed to be ordained as a priest to serve, he was in exile and out of job priest. Then the second, second dating is a dating to the year of the exile, the fifth year of the exile of King Jehoiachin. So if he was exiled around 597, so in the fifth year will lead us to around 593 because uh, Hebrew calendar overlaps with our, our normal calendar because their year begins in September. So there's a bit of overlap. But you can minus four years and then date it to the fifth year. That fifth year will be this. That means we can actually have a date. And if you look at the calendar, fifth day of the fourth month, the Jewish month of the year, it can bring us back to our time, uh, to our calendar, and it's end of June, 593. So we can be very precise. Now, one of the amazing things about the book of Ezekiel is it has many dates. 
Many of the chapters are preceded with a dating. Why the precision? Someone says, well, Ezekiel was trained to be a priest. He was literate. He knew how to read and write. And so he was able to then lock down his uh, oracles, his prophecies, according to the dating. So we have many of these datings. I think they're all about uh, 20, 70 to 20 datings marking over the different chapters. So the first dating we are told, in this year, his calling came. So let's look at the calling. As you say, the calling is the one that often stumps a lot of people. Imagine if you are an artist and you read chapters 1 to 3 and you try to draw what Ezekiel see, I think you will have a bit of a problem. Okay, so Ezekiel says he was at the river Keba and then he saw God appearing. But God, what God appeared first was in a storm, a desert storm. In a desert, you have these huge desert storms that are generated and these winds are blowing. And then in that desert storm, you see somebody sitting on a throne, the Ancient of Days. Okay, And this Ancient of Days is accompanied by four living creatures that have four faces. So you have these four living creatures with four faces. And the four faces, of course, is one of a lion, one of a ox, one of a eagle, one of a man. Four faces. Okay, And each of these four faces, of course, has a symbolism there. Lion, king of the wild animals. Ox, king of all the domesticated animals. Eagle, king of all the birds. Man, apex of God's creation. See, the four, the four phases of the four living creatures, each one stands for one thing. So, lion, ox, eagle, and the human face, each one represents the apex of God. Either wild animals, domestic animals, king of the birds, or of the creation. So he's talking about the angels that, that worship God and they face four directions because they have four faces, which means they can be anywhere as they go. And then there's also, as you look on in that vision, there is a wheel within a wheel. When we think about a wheel within a wheel, the only thing we can think about today is a gyroscope. A gyroscope is something in which there's a wheel, a wheel, a wheel. But then there are eyes set on the hills. So what, what, what is this vision that he sees? Okay, this, this fabulous vision. I think what he saw was very simply the throne vision. This is what we call the throne vision. God sitting on the throne. Okay? And it conveyed a sense of majesty, power, and also mobility because it is a throne that is not fixed. And the fact that God has appeared now in Babylon tells us he has left Jerusalem and he has come. And that's why the throne is on this set of wheels within wheels and it shows a mobility. It can move to the north, to the south, to the east, to the west. So in that amazing vision which will not be secured off, you know, uh, knock him off for a few days because of that, of that vision, uh, you, you, you can see how powerful it is. And here in that vision, he is then given He's called to be a prophet. But a prophet sent to a rebellious house, a people who are stiff-necked and stubborn. That means he's already warned. It's going to be, not going to be easy. He's given, I'm telling you to people who will not uh, pay a lot of attention to you. You guys, you are not going to get a lot of response from them. And... Uh, Whatever you say, very often they will just turn around and uh, just ignore you. And so you find that he does a few things. In the book of Ezekiel, you find him doing some of these things. We give it a name, Prophetic Sign Act. A sign act means you do something as a sign to some sort of action. So here in the first sign act that we find, he is told, eat the scroll that God shows him. So God, told, God showed him a scroll. Okay. And then he says, uh, this scroll, God says, there is writing on the front and on the back, and on, on it was written words of lamentation and mourning and woe. So the, that, that word, the words here are not good words to hear, okay? Lament. And then he is told, Son of man, eat what is offered to you, eat this scroll, and then go and speak to the house of Israel. So eating this 
scroll which contains all these words of lament, moaning, woes. That means that is his message. It was a negative message, a message of judgment, a message of woe, a message of God's judgment upon them for their sins. So it wasn't an easy message. And you know, sometimes we wish God sometimes gives us a nice message to preach. Uh, but sometimes the message has to be hard hitting. Sometimes you have to take out the big stick and preach a hard message in the church. You can't be always just uh, cons- consoling people, you know, sayang, you know, like, like what we do with positive strokes on the cat. Many times you may have to do the negative and very often that uh, antagonize people. So his message, he was already warned, is not going to be an easy message. And so to prepare himself, God says you need to harden your face like flint. Flint is a very hard stone that ancient people, uh, cavemen, you know, they use these hard stones which can be very sharp because they are stone which are made up of atoms in layers so you can split a, a, a stone like flint and you can make it very sharp and you often use it as knives but it, it's hard it's something like steel to, to make your face as hard as flint means god was already warning him is it you because you're going with a hard message the people will reject you so you got to put your face as hard as flint so in chinese we also say the same thing, you know, mean pay how you have to make your face very thick skin, you have to endure. Okay, so it will be a difficult ministry for seven years. He will have to endure as he preached this difficult message. How maybe sometimes we have a nice, you know, sword quoted message to preach to people. No, but sometimes our message is hard. So he will already warn you will have to, to harden your faces against them and uh, just endure and bear because they are not going to listen to you. Then God took him by the, by the Spirit and set him back in the river Keba. So in a sense, he was like perhaps brought up into, into that spiritual realm to see that throne vision. And then God sent him back. And, that, and at that place where the exiles were living, that is the name Tel Aviv. Today, of course, the B, the Hebrew is written as a V because B that doesn't start sounds like a V. And you can see this name, Tel Aviv, is today now the same name which has become the capital of Israel. So when the people came to Israel and emigrated in the 19th century and settled down in the place north of Jaffa, they created this new settlement and they thought about the story of Ezekiel, how he was living in this little village called Tel Aviv in River Kebra. So the the immigrants, the Jewish immigrants, also named the place Tel Aviv. Tel Aviv it simply means what? Tel is a word which means a mount or a hill. Aviv is a word which means springtime. So hill of spring or hill of springtime. So it means it's like there's a bit of hope. It is like the winter has passed and we are now into spring and spring is all green and all this. So, so today they named the place Tel Aviv. As a capital city. So he was here in this place where God sent him back down to the exiles and he will begin his ministry to preach to them. And then we find a second vocation and that was commissioning as a watchman. So uh, we will see him doing this more as he begins the chapter 33 onwards. So for the first part, it was more of a prophet speaking and to show the people, the exiles, that something has happened to this man. God struck him dumb. Okay. So when he was sent back to the exiles at Tel Aviv, he came back dumb. Now we remember in, in the New Testament, there was a similar story of the father of John the Baptist, Zechariah. He met the angel Gabriel when he was serving inside the temple in the holy place. And of course, he found it hard to believe. So the angel then told Zechariah, no, you, you'll be dumb. And you only speak until when your child is born. And then when the child is born, you will call his name John. And exactly when he came out of the, the holy place, he couldn't speak. And his fellow priests all knew he must have met you know, God or an angel, and that was the sign of his encounter. And here, empowered by the Spirit, 
God will, God told him, you know, rest of the time you'll be dumb. Only when God gives him the word to speak, and then he will be, he will be able to speak. Now that itself becomes a sign act. Send back to his people, they all knew, hey, is it what happened to you? He couldn't speak. Dumb. And he probably actually had to write on a tablet, a clay tablet. But there'll be times when finally he has to speak, he began to speak, and then people realize hey, he's speaking. But the moment he finished speaking, he comes back dumb again. So that itself was a powerful sign act, a prophetic sign act to the people that God is with this man. And yet we find the people still find it hard to believe that Ezekiel could have been a priest. I mean, he was a, he was a priest. How did he become a prophet? Just like Jeremiah was also born into the line of a priest. And then when God called him to become a prophet, even his own family people, kinfolk from the tower, and I thought, don't believe in Jeremiah. See, so that was a hard part. So the account of calling sets those chapters there to tell us that he was a man sent back to his own people, fellow exiles. We have a very difficult message to preach, and yet people are not going to listen to him. He's already warned, and that's why he's told, set your face as flints because you have to bear and endure this, but yet continue to do all this and continue to preach whenever the word comes, and then uh, endure and bear with it. And how long do bear with it? Well, third, 28 chapters or 29 chapters of preaching heart message. Okay, so we already said chapter 4 to 32 are what we call these 29 chapters. They are all prophecies of judgment. They start off first with his own people, deal with them first, and then he will turn his attention to foreign nations as well, those that surrounded Judah. And so his message was two parts, first to his own people and then to the other nations. In the first part, you can divide it into six smaller sections. So easier to grasp that way. So we're going to work through just this six sections quickly. Uh, we don't have time to go in there, but it will give you a good overview of what is to say. So imagine if you are a prophet, Armed with a message of judgment to your own people, what do you say? Well, of course, you have to tell them, sorry, friends, you guys are thinking that God will save uh, the people back home in Jerusalem and then save us from exile and release us and bring us back home. No, sorry, it's going to be a long haul. We are not going to go home. Many of us will be here. And that was basically how he began his message. So six sections. 4 to 7, 8 to 11, 12 to 14, 15 to 17, 18 to 19, 20 to 24. So I'll sum up, sum them up as we look at each of these sections. So in 4 to 7, he's basically his message is doom. There's no positive uh, word at all. Sometimes the prophets in the 8th century, the Isaiah, they preach a bit of hope, a bit of judgment, a bit of hope, a bit of judgment, hope and judgment interspersed. So that you don't always just preach negative all the time. Imagine if every Sunday in a Greater Grace Pater Pahat, every sermon is heart hitting, every sermon is judgment, every Sunday sermon is fire and brimstone. I think it will be very hard for many of us to think. So some days you need to be more of a consolation and hope and deliverance. Other days you come back with judgment. So you alternate. But you, you don't find that alternating pattern in Ezekiel. Everything is entirely negative. Okay. And he will start preaching from this date to this date. And it's going to be about seven years. Because he will continue preaching until five. It's five because it took a man two years to run with the news after the city has fallen. So by the time he was vindicated, it was five, eight, five. And there will almost be seven, eight years. Seven, eight years of preaching just judgment and doom. But it's not just mere preaching. He accompanied the preaching with sign acts. Not like today. Very often when we preach, sometimes we, we, we use a visual aids like uh, PowerPoint, you know, or we show a video clip. Well, in the old days, you don't have all these uh, facilities. So you go to act out yourself. Uh, very often the preacher has to act out the message. So he, he used three prophetic sign acts to accompany his message so that people can understand what was he saying. So in the first, you can see he make a scale model of Jerusalem, you know, using clay, build a little scale model, and then tell people that is Jerusalem. And then 
Then the enemy, he makes all these little seeds machines, you know, that will ram the wall, break down the wall, make all these little, little things, put them on his... So imagine he is in his house, he will build a wall city and all this, and then he will build siege machines uh, of the enemy pounding the wall of the, the of the city and to last week that you know there's some will fall and uh, and there will be no hope for the city okay and then he then even eat and drink like rationing his food and then when people ask him, hey crazy man what are you doing well i eat my food with fear and trembling and i eat it with ration because when the city of jerusalem will be besieged uh, people wouldn't have enough food and, and that were what will happen to the city. And then, of course, the third one was the most interesting. We talk about the hair. He shaved his hair so that he, you know, he made himself up. divided the hair into three parts. Each part is supposed to symbolize something. So one part, it was burned by fire to show that one third of the people in Jerusalem would die by fire. And then one third of the hair, he would use a, a sword to chop at it and that would show one third of the people will die by them. And then he will hide one third of the hair in the hell of his garment. And then that is to tell that God will preserve a remnant of the people. Not everybody will die. So, acting out to illustrate the message. But poor guy, because after this message, he's bought up. <laughs> and uh, you, you, you take time, months for his hair to grow back. Just illustrate one sermon, you shave up your head. Uh, and uh, you, you, that's, that's what you had to do to illustrate the message. You had to do all the sign X. And then we see as you continue the message, it is definitely negative. Chapter 7, entirely negative. Uh, behold, the day is coming. Because everybody thought that the day of the Lord was always a day in the past where God will defeat their enemies. So the people always thought in those days, whenever they preach, the prophets preach about the day of the Lord, Yom Yahweh, you know, God will defeat the enemies. But no, the prophets turn it around. They say the day of the Lord is not the, a day when God will destroy the enemies. It's a day when God will destroy you. God will punish you because you guys have sinned. So behold, the day it comes and your doom has come. And injustice has blossomed, pride has budded, violence has grown up. And because of all these things, God will punish. So the first Chapters 4 to 7 are entirely negative. And you can see a reason given in chapter 7. Each time he says when God do these things, what is, what is the reason for it? And the reason is always that particular phrase, then you will know that I am the Lord. Lord, of course, is our English translation of Yahweh. Then you will know I am Yahweh. So this statement, I am Yahweh, is the whole purpose of why God does all these things. Why does God punish His people? So that they will know, I am Yahweh. I am God. Don't play play with me. See, three times in these chapters, why God tells why He does all this, then you will know I am the Lord. Verse 4. Verse 9. You have the same phrase. Then you will know, I am the Lord who smite. Very interesting. I am the Lord who smite. Smite is an old... Uh, King James word that is used. You know, uh, smite is like you use the back of your hand and you slap someone in the face, you know, just smite. So God smite us with the sword. Very powerful. And God, God says that you will know, I'm the Lord. I'm the one who smite you. I'm the one who used Babylon as my agent of destruction. Babylon is not doing all this on their own initiative forever. No, I use Babylon to bring all these things. And then verse 27 also again, that, you know, with all this judgment, I will judge them and then you will know I am the Lord. So everything has a purpose. All this to show you that even if God were to punish his people, there is a purpose. So the people will know who is God. And here in 8 to 11, we find now the reasons are given. Why must God punish the people so hard? Why not just a simple punishment? No, now the reasons are given. And you can see, when the reasons are given, you can probably then shake your head and say, yeah, the people have really sinned against God. So what was the reason for the coming destruction of the city of Jerusalem and the coming destruction of the temple? That was because the people did all these abominable things 
inside the temple. So what happened was, Ezekiel was brought on a night vision. God took him in a night vision all the way back to Jerusalem. And then God showed him what was happening inside the temple. The priests and all these people, they were worshipping all these strange gods, idols, okay, uh, the queen of heaven, uh, worshipping all these things. Everybody was supposed to be worshipping Yahweh. They were involved in idolatry, which is forbidden. So that God is actually telling the people, look, your own leaders, the priests, are committing this. And the temple is polluted. So God says, therefore, I will destroy them. Judgment, judgment must always begin with God's people first. See, God can destroy other people, but then there's a bit unfair because other people don't know God. Judgment always begin with God's own people because why? You know God and yet you choose to sin against God. So therefore, we are the ones without excuse, not the Gentiles or pagans who don't know God. We who know God, therefore, we don't have any excuse if we sin against God. And if God would give us judgment, we thoroughly deserve the judgment. And then chapter 10, as the people think about how can God destroy Jerusalem? The temple is in Jerusalem. Well, guys, don't you know? God will remove his glory from the temple before the city falls. Which means when the city falls, God's presence is no longer in the temple. It's a hollow building. It's an empty building. God will take his glory, his kavod, and remove it. And the kavod actually goes all the way to Babylon. Because we see God's glory, he left the temple, and then he went towards the east. So, to the east of the temple is Mount of Olives. And then from the Mount of Olives to the east, you are going towards the Middle East, and that's where Babylon is. So, God's glory left the temple and went towards the east. That means God's glory has now come to the exiles in Babylon. God is no longer back home. The temple is just an empty shell. And because it's an empty shell, when the people, when the city is destroyed, you know, the, city, the, the temple will be destroyed, looted, and burned. And so in chapter 11, Ezekiel is then called to prophesy against some of the leaders, because the leaders are the ones who lead people astray. Some of the leaders are supposed to be telling the people to do the right thing, you know, and yet they're advising the king, they counsel badly the king. Remember the last king was the uncle, uh, Zedek, Zedekiah who sat on the throne. The legitimate king, Jehoiachin, was taken to exile in, his, in the king's place. The uncle, Zedekiah, was placed by Nebuchadnezzar. And the king was badly counseled by many of the people who played politics in the royal court. Many of these people were at, you know, pro-Egyptian, thinking that the Egyptians will help us. So they counseled the king badly. And especially five, 25 of them were named. These 25 counselors, they counseled the people badly and they're the ones responsible for taking Jerusalem on the wrong road, on the wrong track. Instead of trusting God, they are now trusting in political alliances. So God says, well, they will also be punished. Okay. Then not only are those counselors the ones at fault, in the midst of Jerusalem in this time, there were also people, false prophets who have risen up. You know, false prophets are those prophets who are preaching, claiming to speak on God's behalf, but God has not given them a message. And so these are the preachers preaching out their own vain imagination. They imagine God will come and, and deliver us and save us and bring us back home from exile. No, God didn't say that. They are false. And then they are also weeping women prophets selling sympathetic magic. They are telling people, you know, uh, you buy this for me, you know, and this is a very powerful amulet, and these are things which will uh, perhaps be uh, a talisman, you know. And so these, these women, they sew magic bands. You know, magic bands, like you, you probably now have probably heard about some people doing this as well. During the time of COVID, some of the people will tell you, oh, no need to take the vaccine. No, you put this on and that will uh, shield you from uh, the germs. Yeah, and they, they will remember Proverbs selling this and they will sing God about Ezekiel. Why? You are leading people astray by all these other things. 
So you find that he continued to give the reasons why. And then elders came. These are elders in exile. And they visited Ezekiel because they probably now began to hear that there was this man speaking. But this, this exiles, these elders themselves are stubborn. They also don't want to trust God. And so he, Ezekiel turns around to them and says, well, you guys come and want to listen to me. You ask me, uh, what is God speaking? I tell you, but you don't believe. And so he actually chastised them. He called them to repent, to turn around from the wicked ways. And he says, no, if, if, if you don't, even if God were to send three great intercessors, people like Noah, Daniel, Job, even they cannot save the nation of Israel through their prayers. They may save themselves, but they can't save the people. You see, they, the people are stiff necked and stubborn. And God will continue to judge the nation. You see, what does God use? God uses his agents. And God can use anything as an agent. In the story of Job, remember God had a wind that blew on the house and that wind fell down and killed Job's 10 children. Another time, fire came down from heaven and burned up all the sheep. Another time, desert raiders came you know, and, uh, and took away his livestock. God can use different types of agents. Anything can be an agent in God's hand. Wind, water, fire, animals, human beings. Here, in verses 21 to 23 of 14, God says, I will send four acts of judgment. God will use four agents of judgment to judge the people. And there will be one, the sword. That means this is war. God will use war to come upon the people. And then God will allow famine to come. The people will run out of water to drink. And then God will allow the land to be, uh, to be with this beast that comes and they will kill the people. And then there'll be pestilence that will destroy the livestock and the food. So God says, you guys don't listen to me. How much more, God says, when I send upon Jerusalem my four saw acts of judgment, saw famine, evil beasts, and pestilence. And so cut off from it man and beast. You know, when we think about all these things, these are what we call the curses of the covenant. The curses of the covenant are what we find in Deuteronomy 27, 28. A list of blessings and a list of curses. If the people who make this covenant with God keeps the covenant, then God will bless them. But if the people who make this covenant with God do not keep the covenant, God will invoke upon himself the curses of the covenant. And the curses of the covenant involve such things. There will be drought, famine, God will close up the wombs of the women, the orchards, there will be war, rumors of war, and finally, ultimately, exile. So we really see God is using all the different curses of the covenant, and the ultimate, ultimate one, of course, is exile, in which the people themselves are already in Babylon. And yet, you find the people still find it hard to believe we are reaping the curses of the covenant. Then 15 to 17, continuing on negative preaching, because they're all judgment preaching, but this time using parables, prophetic parables. Parables are like what Jesus used. They are story form, and they use characters in the story to illustrate a message. So in a parable, there's always one main message that you find inside the story. And so you find in 15, 16, 17, there are parables that are used. 15 is a very short one, a single parable. He says, Jerusalem is like a piece of wood that comes on the vine. You know, the, the vine plant, the grape plant, is a very, is a, is a crawly plant. The plant crawls, and so you will have leaves, and then you will have all the fruits hanging, all this. But if you look at the wood of the vine, the vine, the wood is actually very, very thin and very gnaw, is always twist and turn. And so actually very useless to use the wood for making anything because you want to make a table, you need to have a bigger piece of tree trunk where you can slice it into planks and make wood from the vine is actually useless. So in the end, when you finish harvesting your grapes and the tree is too old, what do you do with the wood? Well, it's only good for burning as fuel. You, you cut it down as fuel. 
Now, if Jerusalem is equivalent to like a like the wood of the wine, that means the city is only good for being burned by fire in the end. That means it's like, what's the point of saving all the wood from the vine? They're useless. You can't use it to make anything. They're too thin, too narrow, too gnarly. Uh, you know? So you just use it for firewood and burn. So the city of Jerusalem will be burned by fire. 16 is a long chapter, 63 verses in all. And it uses a, a parable of Jerusalem like a daughter, but a prodigal daughter. Prodigal means a disobedient uh, daughter who runs away and uh, don't obey and all this. So it, it starts off with the story of how God you know, raised up this daughter, saved her, gave her all the best. And yet this daughter played the whore, you know, played the harlot, as we say, prostituted herself to other lovers. Instead of being faithful to God, chased after all foreign gods, gods of Baal, Baal. And so you, you, the people actually worship all these gods of Baal, although they are still covenanted with God. And so it became faithless. And so when you, when you describe a nation like a person who played the whore, who prostitute yourself, that means you are useless. Uh, you are not faithful to your husband or to your partner. And so judgment will come upon Jerusalem. And God will not totally destroy her because God still remembers the covenant that he established. So God will preserve a remnant. God will still save the city. And that's why the remnant are those who have gone to exile in Babylon. God will make sure they will stay there in Babylon. When the time is right, the remnant in Babylon will return home and then they will rebuild the nation afresh. So God is still faithful. God doesn't totally destroy God's people just because they have sinned against him. God saves and preserves the remnant. 17, you have two parables using eagles. Okay, And two eagles. And these eagles represent Assyria and Egypt. Okay, so using bird imagery. And the, the, the imagery, again, you can read this parable. And uh, in this, in this uh, so-called uh, parable, it describes the king of Assyria and the king of, uh, of Egypt, like two, two eagles. And they carry off uh, a great eagle with great wings and long pinions, rich in plumo of many colors, came to Lebanon and took up his set, took up and took up the top of the cedar, and then uh, he took up the seed of the land and planted it in fertile soil and placed it beside abundant waters and set it like a little twig and all these things, and he became a vine and broke forth branches. Then another, another came, and then uh, the question is asked, could it utterly grow? So it's basically saying that it's the whole story is about the history. Everybody as, a, as an exile, know the history. The legitimate king was exiled, Jehoiakim. In his place, his uncle, Zedekiah, was placed on the throne. But this uncle didn't really trust God, even though he had the prophet Jeremiah to minister to him. He preferred to ally with the Egyptians. He thought the Egyptians would come and help him. And eventually you find, uh, just as the eagle, the, the bird would be carried away. So eventually God will remove Zedekiah and then hopefully restore back the rightful ruler that's Jehoiakim. So the people in exile still look up to this guy as the legitimate king. He is a real king, although he has been removed and become an exile uh, king. This is the legitimate king. He, he was puppet ruler put on the throne by Nebuchadnezzar. So basically, we're using the history of the people, but in story form to get their attention. So three parables, 15, 16, 17, to explain what is God is doing among the people. 18, 19 continues on with Proverbs and parables. And tomorrow's sermon is based on uh, chapter 18. So I will explain a bit more about this parable. The people were sometimes quoting parables in the exile. You know, they had these sayings. Uh, they created sayings like this. And these sayings actually reflect their disappointment, their complaint against God. So one of them is this, this saying, the fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. So they're actually complaining. Our forefathers eat the, sour, eat the sour grape, they should be the ones to feel the effect. But then God is not fair. God allowed the children to, to be the one who will feel the effect. So the forefathers sin, they should be the ones to be punished. But no, 
somehow God is now punishing us, the, the younger generation. We are the children and we are the ones who went to exile. So they're saying, therefore, God is not fair. Now, God will dispute and challenge that and God will answer with a change. And God says, no longer will this proverb be used in, the, in exile because God says now, from now on, every person is responsible for your own sin. That means now, no longer are you going to suffer just because your forefathers sinned and now you reap the effects. Now, if you sin, you have to pay the price of your own sin. So tomorrow, sermon uh, will explain a bit more about this. Then 19, another parable of two young lions and the parable of the vine. You see, he uses a lot of parables to explain the story. And the whole chapter is very, very interesting. The whole chapter has a certain rhythm. The rhythm is in Hebrew, they often have two lines in poetry. So whenever they speak, there are always two lines. But then you, in the two lines, you have a certain sense of stress, rhythm. So one, two, three, one, two, three. So the, the two lines are often therefore quite so-called similar in length and similar in terms of stress. One, two, three, a second line, very well balanced, one, two, three. But then there are times when this rhythm is broken. You have one, two, three, one, two. So this is a three, three rhythm. This is a three, two. The three, two rhythm has a name. It's called a kinameter. This meter is shorter in the, that means it's like one, two, three, one, two. One, two, three, one, two. So something is something has dropped out in the second line. Whereas in the three three is a very happy beat. One, two, three, one, two, three. One, two, three, one, two, three. In fact, this is this is like a wash beat. You know, boom, cha, cha, boom, cha, cha, boom, cha, cha, boom, cha, cha. Very happy beat. But in this kinal rhythm, one, two, three, one, two. One, two, three, one, two. One, two, three, one, two. Second line, something is missing. Okay. And because of that, it's a very sad rhythm. And they often use this rhythm for funeral songs. So when they sing the funeral songs, it has this rhythm. One, two, three, one, two. One, two, three, one, two. Now we, we, can't, we can't discern the rhythm because what we are reading is in English. And when you read in English, it's a translation. So you have lost the rhythm. But in Hebrew, it has this rhythm. And if you are a Hebrew reader, the moment you hear someone speaking with a rhythm, you know, hey, this is a funeral song. And this whole chapter is written with a funeral song and it describes two young lions. Now, lions we know are often a metaphor for kings. And so it's, it's referring like perhaps to the, David, the Davidic kings. And talking about two, lion, not two young lions. Again, you know the history of what happened. One of the kings called Jehoaz was taken by the Egyptians and exiled to Egypt. And in his place, his brother was... Uh, put there, and there was Jehoiakim. So Jehoiakim became king for the next 10 years. And then as he died, he left behind his son. So Jehoiakim is the son. Okay. So this was his brother. So one of the lions was taken by Egypt, then led to this king. And then and this king died, left behind his young son, sitting on the throne, and this young fellow had to face Nebuchadnezzar. And he was taken to Babylon, exiled to Babylon. So two of the lions were exiled, one to the west, to Egypt, one to the east, to Babylon. Okay. So it's, it's, a, it's a way of talking about, this is our history. Okay. And there are, you know, our kings are all taken away. Then the second parable about the vine, if vine here, is the same as the lion, the king. That means it's, it's like talking about this is the end of the Davidic rule. That's why no more Davidic king will sit on the throne. And even when we come at home for my exile, there are no more Davidic kings. And in this whole chapter 19, if you read it, you don't find God at all. God is totally absent in this whole chapter. It's like saying, well, that's because you guys, you kings, you guys are all playing politics. You never inquire 
from me what you guys should be doing. You are busy making politics, talking about alliances with Egypt and all sorts of things. You never ask me, what's God saying? So they left God out of the picture, so therefore God will leave them out of the picture. So that's why the whole nation comes to an end, and the last legitimate king himself is in exile, even in Babylon. And finally, when the people did return home, no more king will sit on the throne. When they came at home, they were only just Jewish governors, Chess Bazaar, Zerubbabel, and later Nehemiah. And after that, for 100 years, the Hasmonians, the priest kings, but no David king ever sat back on the throne of the nation. Because, well, you guys, you want to play politics, you don't trust God, so God also removed you from the, from the equation. And the final set of chapters of judgment against his own people, again, drawing lessons from history. We can date it, okay? In chapter 20, we have a dating, and we can work out the dating to this period of time. In the seventh year, in the fifth month, on the tenth day of the month, certain of the elders of Israel came to inquire the Lord and sat before me. So from that dating, we know now it's about two years of preaching already. And he then tells them the history. And, and what, when he tells these elders how we look at the history, he says, you know, our history repeats itself. It goes round, like what we find in the book of uh, Judges. Remember in the book of Judges, we find a cyclic pattern of history. The people commit apostasy against God. They forgot about God. So what does God do? God allowed the enemies to oppress them. So oppressed by the enemy. Then they cry to God for help. And then God hears. And then God sends a, God sends a judge to deliver the people. And then the judge will fight against the enemy. And then the land had rest. So in the book of Judges, we find a pattern like this. A cyclic pattern. The problem is, you should then go out of the cycle and so-called leave, leave as a tangent. But the problem is that you went back into the circle and you repeat again. After they have rest for 40 years, they forgot about God, commit apostasy, God allowed enemies to oppress them, they cry to God for help, God sent a judge, they have deliverance, they have rest for 40 years, then they forget about God again. So history repeats itself. When Ezekiel tells his history to the elders in chapter 20, he tells them, well, our history repeats itself. It's a constant history of rebellion, of failure. Uh, the worst part is repetition of failure, not learn. That means we never learn from our failure. We always say, once beaten, twice shy. Once they're beaten, you should learn from it. Okay? But they don't seem to learn. They go back into the cycle. And in that, repeating the history, God tells them what are the things that anger God. And God gave a whole list of the abominable things. The, the people worshipping uh, idols, stiff neck, and all these. So you can read up the whole text and see they pollute themselves uh, with all this uh, false worship. They worship on high places, every green tree, you know, what, things that God hates, and they were doing all this. So the history of Israel actually is a terrible history. You read the book of First and second kings, you can see the whole list of the people doing again the same old thing. It's a cycle that never repeats. Never, they never break the cycle. When chapter 21, you can divide it into four parts, and the word sword is used 16 times in this chapter. Sword means what? War. God will bring war and destruction to the people. And in this whole chapter, you will see how God will execute his judgment on the people. And God is going to use his agent. Babylon is only God's agent. God will use the sword of Babylon. And Babylon will come and there will be a cruel people and they will come upon God's people upon, and others will also help them and all these people will suffer. So God already warned them. There's no hope. God has already let go and shift the sword. God has drawn the sword from the shift. You know, like some people say, the moment you pull out a sword from the shift, you have to taste blood before you go back in. So the idea is, God has really pulled the sword out of the shift. He will not go back into the 
into the tree unless he has already done his work. So God has already unsheathed the sword. Babylon, Babylon will come and swallow up all nations, including Jordan, and uh, people will pay the price. The final uh, chapters of all this are talking about what God will use, war and exile upon the people. And here in chapter 22, there's only one topic, and this whole topic is about Jerusalem, the city. A city that's supposed to be beautiful, supposed to be, you know, the, like Mount Zion, the highest of all mountains, supposed to be a holy city, and supposed to be a city that is pure as become dross. You know, dross is like you know, something that's impure. And it's about land that's not cleansed. You know, pollution has filled the whole land. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's like God is totally disappointed. It's almost similar to what you find in Isaiah chapter 1. In Isaiah chapter 1, uh, written in the 8th century, the same old message is, is described of, of the city Jerusalem. Jerusalem is supposed to be a pure and holy city has become dross. You no, know, it's like beer diluted with water. There's no more cake in it already. Uh, and, and God will have to do something to turn the city back. So the end of the one, God will then turn back to the city. And then it will be a beautiful city and a city where God's presence will be, will be there and God will be there with the city. But before that can happen, the land is not cleansed. The land is polluted and all this. So war will have to come and uh, judgment will have to come upon the city. So, and again, using history, Interesting history because he uses history as a parable. And he uses two sisters. And these two sisters are given names, Ohola and Oholiba. Okay. And when you read the story, you know what, is, what they are. One sister represents Samaria, capital of the northern kingdom of Israel that had already been exiled and destroyed uh, by the Assyrian in 72 BC. And then the other sister is Oholiba, and you know who that is. That is a reference to Jerusalem. Okay, And this is the capital of the southern kingdom. So they stand for, uh, they stand as a metaphor to refer to both. Okay, So it is like, well, two sisters married to the same spouse, because the same spouse is Again, here you can see they trusted in their Assyrians. Uh, and, you know, like Manasseh, even from Judah, went all the way to Assyria, took back some earth to come back home to build an earth altar to worship the gods of Assyria. I mean, terrible. You are supposed to be a king. You are supposed to enforce covenant, loyalty, and faithfulness to obey God. And yet the kings are, are the ones who are playing uh, idolatry and all this. So basically, using an extended metaphor about Israel and Judah. And he's talking about their politics. You guys are not trusting God. See, God is not in the picture. You guys are all playing, you know, alliances. They are making alliances, political alliances with all these powers. Have you learned your lesson? Our northern kingdom has fallen to, uh, to the Assyrians in 722 BC. They were carried off and the 10 tribes that make up North Israel are today all gone. So we talk about the 10 lost tribes. The southern kingdom, well, you guys in, in Judah, you should have learned your lesson. You should not turn around and, and uh, see what has happened to your sister. But yet, you fail. You fail to find that. And that's why now, see, you guys are as well going to exile. So, you can see all these oracles are basically on the southern kingdom and the capital city. Jerusalem. Judah is the remaining southern kingdom. Jerusalem is the capital. 21 chapters are uh, focused on them. They provide you the reasons so that you can try to argue with God. No, God is not fair. No, God is fair. You guys have sinned. You deserve the punishment. God has already sent warning signs. You besiege Jerusalem and God will not deliver Jerusalem. And how to demonstrate the fact that God will not deliver Jerusalem. God will not cry when Jerusalem is destroyed. Here we find another sign act. And this is really a terrible sign act. The wife of Ezekiel died. And God told him, 
your wife is like the apple of your eye, she has died, but you're not supposed to mourn for her. And you are not even supposed to be present when the funeral is being done. So he disappeared at the funeral service. And everybody is wondering, hey, Ezekiel's wife passed away. Where is the man? Where is this guy? He's nowhere to be found. Okay. And then after when the funeral was over, the wife was buried, and then he appears. And then his mouth was open. Remember, most of the time his mouth was dumb. Then he was open to speak. And then he told the people, well, God told me not to attend. How can God tell you not to attend your wife's funeral? My wife is like Jerusalem. I am playing the role of God. So Ezekiel is playing the role of God and his wife is playing the role of Jerusalem. When Jerusalem falls, like my wife's death, God says, I will not mourn for Jerusalem. Wow, what a terrible way to illustrate a message. So Ezekiel never saw his wife for the last time before she was buried. All because he needed to act out this whole idea that God will not mourn and God will not deliver Jerusalem. So the city will be destroyed. And that ends the chapter of 24. So when we think about the judgments of God, sometimes we say, oh, God's judgment is fair, you know. God is so harsh on his own people, punishing them for their sins. Uh, and then, shouldn't God be punishing the sins of the forefathers? Since they're the ones who sin, why should God punish now the children who, and they suffer on behalf of the forefathers? Well, as you struggle over this tonight and think about it, tomorrow I will share the sermon in church and see how God answers this. So we have one last part. And this last part is all those chapters now that deal with oracles against foreign nations. Let's people turn around and say, Ezekiel, how can God be so unfair to punish own people? What about all the other nations? The Philistines, the Phoenicians, Edom, Moab, and what about all those? They also gang up to fight against Babylon. What will God do? Well, God has a message for them. In Ezekiel, we find that they're all grouped together at chapter 25 all the way to 32. We find similar groupings in the other two major prophets. In Isaiah, they're grouped together from chapter 13 to 23. They're all always ends. In Jeremiah, they're grouped together in 46 to 51. In one of the minor prophets in Amos, first two chapters, you find also eight nations are mentioned. Okay, so you do find OANs in three other prophets apart from Ezekiel. Now, what is the purpose of having all these oracles against foreign nations? Two, I think two reasons. One, to show you that you are not alone in your suffering. If you are thinking that why is now God only judging you? No, other nations uh, are, will also uh, have to pay the price for it. So, because you guys are not trusting God, you do all these things and uh, it's a sign that you don't trust God. You play political alliances and then you suffer because of the misfortune of big brothers, you know, like Assyria, Babylon, Persia, Greece, Rome. Yeah, other nations will affect you and you will suffer. Uh, but you're not alone. Other nations will also suffer together. Secondly, it also to show that God's hand is at work. God's hand is at work to pass judgment. That any nation that do injustice and cruelty will not escape. God will somehow have a way of catching up. There is justice will catch up with them. So look at what's happening now in the war between Russia and Ukraine. Whoever started it, whoever is responsible, uh, God one day will remember and pass judgment upon those who, are, who, who deserve such things. So the OAN show you that God is, is actually very fair. We have a, a God who is fair. For the nations who does these things will also be punished by God. So who are the nations then mentioned in the OANs? There are seven nations or city-states. Some of them are actually not a full nation, but there's a city-state. Seven of them are mentioned. So you have Amon, which is here, number, number one. I can't see my mark. 
Amun Amun And then Mo, Moab and Seir And then Edom And then Philistia And then Tyre which is one of the Phoenician cities And then Sidon also one of the Phoenician cities And then finally, Egypt, which uh, will be out of the picture, but it's, it's along this side. And this is the one that's number seven. So you have seven nations and cities that's mentioned. Ammon, Moab, Edom, Philistia, Tyre, Sidon, and finally Egypt. And you can see the chapters that are given. Uh, in chapter 25, Ammon, Moab, and Seir, Edom, and Philistia, four nations are squeezed into one single chapter. Tyre gets three chapters alone, 26, 27, 28. Sidon gets a little bit of chapter 28, so it's a small part. And then Egypt gets the longest, 29, 30, 31, 32. So four chapters are given to Egypt, three chapters are given to Tyre. So it's a bit of, uh, you can say, quite unequal treatment. Uh, because they have longer oracles, whereas others are very short. So four of them share one chapter, and this one took a little part of the chapter, but Tyre and Egypt are the longest. So let's swing around and see. Now this it starts from, from here, and it swings like this, and then from here it goes up, and then from here it goes up, and then the final part swings back down to Egypt. So Amon, now Amon used to be the neighbor to Israel and Judah. So Judah used to be down here and Israel was up here. So they are neighbors. But of course there was uh, that blood between the two because uh, Ammon was descended from one of the daughters of Lot and the father. So the Ammonites, their kingdom uh, was here and the capital city is Rabat Ramon, which today is the modern uh, city of uh, Amman. Okay, so it's and so it's, it's a nearby neighbor, and they are threatened with judgment, and they will face what we call invasion by the people of the east. A phrase that you find used also in other books as I joke and these are the people who are the desert raiders people from the desert they will come and invade this nation so so they will suffer for that and the reason for the punishment is given they were laughing when Judah fell so that means now we are no, no longer talking about 8th century and uh, Israel is already gone so when Babylon came and attacked Jerusalem these guys were laughing over the fate I use the German word Schadenfreude. Schadenfreude means laughing over you know, your enemies, rejoicing over your enemies. They were rejoicing that Judah was suffering. And God says, for that, I will uh, punish you by sending the desert raiders and they will invade your kingdom. And then there's a goal. Why does God punish them? So that again, you will know I am Yahweh. That means you are laughing at yeah, Judah, my people, even though my people are stupid and stubborn and they deserve the punishment, yet they're still my people. And when you go against my people, you go against God. So God says, I will do this to you so that you as a kingdom will know Yahweh is really God. So there's a reason given. When God went, <laughs> allowed the country to be right, there's a reason given why, so that you will know that God is, God is Lord. Moab is a little bit further down, and Moab also has the same dubious history like the Ammonites. Remember, the, the Moabites were descendants of another daughter of Lot and the father Lot. Remember the story of Lot and the two daughters? The two daughters made their father drunk, slept with him, so that they have children. And the children are the ones that produce these two groups of people. So in Lot's story, he hides in a cave somewhere here. The descendants of Lot's two daughters become the Moabites and the Ammonites. So the, the, the Jews don't like the Ammonites and the Moabites because they are not pure blood people. Again, when Judah was 
being attacked by Babylon, they were again rejoicing over the fate of their son. They were saying, Tai Sege, you know, uh, Babylon is attacking you. So what does God do? Again, God will send the threat of judgment. People the east, the desert readers will come and invade Ammon and Moab, just like Ammon, Moab will be invaded. Again, there's a goal so that people will know that I am Yahweh. So that people will know I am God. That means you don't laugh Oh, and rejoice over God's people because one day, who knows, one day you will be the one drinking the same cup. We find in many books in the Old Testament, this whole thing about Moab drinking the cup, Lamentation chapter 4, you know, it is now Judah's turn to drink the cup. One day the cup of suffering will be turned over to you. One day you will drink the cup of suffering. So we don't rejoice when our neighbor, when our enemies fall, the downfall of neighbors. Rather, we should pray for them. Okay and uh, not rejoice and laugh over them. Who knows one day, we ourselves may be the one suffering. Then the third one is down south. So we have one, two, three. So Edom is now number three. And the Edomites were, of course, also related to the people of God. Edomites are descendants of Esau, Jacob's twin brother. And their capital city, of course, that time was in Petra. What is, that? What is the agent that God will use to judge them? Death by the sword. That means again, there will be war. War will come upon Adam. And the reason, the acted revengeful against Judah. Now, what, what happened in history? When Jerusalem was actually being besieged by the Babylonians, okay, I believe Judah sent word out for help. And they appeal to the people that are closest to them in terms of blood kind. So, Edomites, remember, are the descendants of Esau, Jacob's twin brother. So, they are related first persons. Moabites and Ammonites are the descendants of Lot and two daughters. And Lot is a nephew of Abraham. So, it's also related to Judah. So, when Judah was being attacked by Babylon, Judah sent out help. But these guys never helped. These two love the city of Israel. And Edom was still, not only did they not help, they went and ransacked the city after the Babylonians left. We know they went and ransacked the city, looted the city one more time. They acted revengefully. They said, and God says, then I will let them be punished so that they will know my vengeance. Because God always says, vengeance is mine. So God will turn the table. It's like a top. No? God will overturn the table. Adam, you did that to the people in Judah. Now God will let you have a taste of your own medicine. Then number four, Philistia, the Philistine cities. Now the Philistine cities used to gang up as well with the nations to try to fight against the, the foreign power. So they're all part of an axis uh, to stem the power. A coalition of all these uh, grew up together to try to attack. And they were made up of five cities, Gath, Gaza, Ekron, Ashdod, and Eshkelon. So we read in the book of Judges, the five cities and their overlord, their, the so-called ruler of the five cities. And what God will do, God will allow war to destroy the city. Again, what was the reason? They acted revengefully and perhaps again they took advantage of judah when judah was at the weakest and again god says well i'm doing all this so that you will know i am the lord okay so you find that almost the same goal the same region is given why god will do this to this nation because he'll do this then you find two city states are mentioned tyre and sidon now tyre gets a very long almost two and a half over chapters. And in all their four prophecies, why is Tyre single out? There are many cities along here which are ports. There are all these ports that belong to the uh, so-called Phoenicians. Tyre, Sidon, Beirut, Tripoli, Beritus. There are five city ports. These two are single out because they were like the key leaders, the gang leaders. They were allies with Judah to fight against Babylon. And so they have now been punished for their role in rebelling against Babylon. And of course, Tyre also, you can see, boasted because Tyre was actually an island. We don't realize that. Tyre is like an island like Penang, off the coast. So there is actually two Tyre. There is a mainland city of Tyre, 
and there is the island city of Thailand. So this is the island city, and this is the mainland city. When any, whenever the enemy comes and attacks the mainland, the people are very smart. They're all traveled in their boats and sail to the island, and then you know they're, they're quite safe. Uh, if, you, if you are the enemy and you want to attack the island, you have to besiege it with enough boats. So it's very difficult to besiege. So the king of Thailand always boasted, we are very strong, you know, we, we are, our city is up on the cliffs, uh, we will never fall. And even Nebuchadnezzar came, he only conquered the mainland, but he couldn't conquer the island city. And so therefore, the, the king and the prince of Tyre boasted. And you find that that type of boasting almost bordered to uh, some people often really as, as ref a reference to Satan, but I don't think it's Satan, it is the king, and the, and the king and the prince are pride because, because of the city, they think of it as almost impregnable. And Nebuchadnezzar actually besieged the city, he couldn't conquer it, uh, he only took the mainland. It took 200 years down the road to the time of the Greeks under Alexander the Great, who eventually conquered the city of Tyre. And that was because when the Greeks came, they were smart. Okay, the Greeks realized oh, if you're going to surround the city, the island with boats, you have need a lot to have a lot of boats. No, what he did was he he made a boat bridge. He put the boats in the all like this, and tied the boats up, and then the Greeks marched the army across the boats and they invaded the city. The city fell, and eventually what he did was to make sure it was no longer a, an island. Alexander the Great began to pile earth and connect the island. So the today the island is no more an island. The island is now an isthmus. It's part of the there's a road on top of the land going into the island. So it's no longer an island. So eventually when when he conquered the city and and for centuries the city lost its importance. So here you can see why so many chapters, three chapters are single against tired because of their pride. They thought you never fall. Well God prophesies one day you will fall and true enough it will fall but 200 years down the road to Alexander the Great. The other city, of course, is Sidon, further up. Again, Sidon also was one of the ring leaders. Uh, again, God will use judgment and war. And again, all this has the same goal, so that they will know that I am Yahweh. So that covers the, the smaller ones. Then you have that long four chapters against Egypt. The oracles against Egypt form half of all the OANs. Remember the OANs stretch from 24 to 32, but 50% are all against Egypt. So why so many prophecies against Egypt? I think there's only one simple reason. Egypt and Judah were allies. And Judah courted favor from Egypt. You know, help us and we become allies and Egypt always promised, okay, you know, I will come and all this. But Egypt, we know, will always fail to come. So Egypt will never send the armies to come and help to fight against the enemies. They will wait for you to fight first and then they will come. The enemy, the arms will always come much later after the war is over. And so because of that, it's always failed prophecies, failed prophecies, failed prophecies. And so Egypt is described, even though you have all your, you know, your, your boats and your sailors and you sail the great river now, which is like a, like, a, like a dragon, like a serpent, because the river is like a serpent, it snakes down the, the country and you know, it's a metaphor to describe Egypt. Yeah, one day Egypt will fall. So you have these six, uh, they're all together seven prophecies, six of them have datings. All the prophecies describe how eventually Egypt, whatever good it is, whatever promise you have, it will fall and it will be given to Nebuchadnezzar and Nebuchadnezzar actually did conquer Egypt. Egypt fell to Nebuchadnezzar. Pharaoh's army will be destroyed and uh, it will be broken and uh, Egypt will lose everything and they're like a cedar tree which will be cut down and then Pharaoh himself will like symbolically go down to Sheol and uh, it will be like a final humiliation. That means when Egypt is defeated by Nebuchadnezzar, then everybody will look at Egypt and say, oh, you, you talk so great. Uh, you say you're so great and see, you fall. And all the nations and the rulers will witness the downfall of Pharaoh and they will know, well, this guy couldn't help us. So it's actually when you, when, remember, if you're in exile, 
in Babylon and you're hearing all these seven articles about Egypt, what comes to your mind? Hey, our king, the puppet king Zedekiah, he is thinking that Egypt will help him. He's making political alliances with Egypt. Here, we are being told by Ezekiel, Egypt will fail. The Egypt will fail to keep his promises and they themselves will be defeated. So how can someone that will be defeated in the end help you? A blind cannot lead the blind. Both will fall into the ditch. So if Egypt will be one day defeated, how can he ever hope to help Judah? So these oracles against Egypt was to tell the people, the exiles, don't trust in Egypt. Egypt will not help us. Egypt cannot help us. Egypt itself will fall. So all these oracles lament the downfall. It is like to push and hit the mind, the heads of the people, you know, don't look to Egypt. See, the people were all looking to Egypt for help. The people in Judah. But the people in Judah failed to remember to look up to God. <laughs> they all looked to Egypt. They thought that the horses of Egypt, the chariots of Egypt, will come and save us. They forgot that God is also a divine warrior. God can help us. And so the oracles of nations tackle seven nations and city-states, each one for a different reason. Some because they laugh at Judah's downfall. Some because they fail to help Judah in, in her problem. Others were, were punished because they were also ringleaders trying to do this coalition to fight against Babylon. And then finally, Egypt is singled out for all its broken promises. It will never be able to help God's people. And so, single Egypt out, don't look to Egypt, turn your eyes back to God. But remember, this our preaching fell on deaf ears, and the people just could not believe and accept it. So, today, as you think about it, you see the OANs are very, very good. They remind us that God is still at work among the nations. God still works. God still will raise up kings, put down kings. God will judge certain nations for their insolence, for their sins just as he judged his own people. So I think God still actively works today among the nations. Okay, so we have covered the first 32 chapters. I hope that will give you an idea. First three chapters, the calling of, is of Ezekiel to be prophet and a watchman. And then begins his preaching. And the first set of preaching from 4 to 32 are all negative judgment preaching. No positive at all, all entirely judgment. And then judgment speech starts at home first to God's people. From 4 to 24, everything is about God's people because you need to know the reasons why you're going to exile. Then 25 to 32, then now why will God also judge other nations? They also need to be judged because they also fail against God. So everything is just negative today. Second half of the year, we will then turn to the opposite side and look at all the positive oracles of hope, deliverance, salvation. So today, it is all bad news. <laughs> bad news for God's people, bad news for the nation, because you sin, God will have to punish. So, so in a way, it's like reminding yourselves, you cannot outrun God's justice. God's justice will catch up with you. Okay, let me pass it back to the host. Thank you, Doctor, for that panoramic the survey of 32 yeah, chapters. 32 chapters. Uh, I trust that we are fully enlightened, uh, at least to a certain degree. Any, you're going to take questions? Yeah, okay, no problem. I'm only giving you the skeleton, so you need to go back and now begin to read those chapters. But when you read the chapters, you roughly have an idea of what you're reading. See, when, when you have no idea what you're reading, you can get lost when you start reading chapter 4, 5, 6, 7, what are all these? But if you divide them into the smaller blocks, ah, okay, now you see why. Sometimes it gives you the, the reasons why they're being punished. Sometimes you point out these are the, the reasons why abomination, or idolatry, political alliances. He points out the reason and then he explains things using parables, you know, using story forms, metaphors, very interesting way of telling stories. Like today in church, we also use stories to illustrate and uh, a lot of metaphors. So, and then he also uses a lot of sign acts to back up his preaching, he acts out 
and that crazy man will act out some of his messages, you know, shape his head brought up. I cannot imagine myself doing that. You know, you shape after that, you'll be brought up for how many more months after that, you know, before your hair grows back. But he does this. I remember the, what was the worst one he did. That prophetic sign act when the wife died, he didn't turn up for the funeral. But that was perhaps even the hardest one to do. And yet, that, that, I think that would impress the people. Hey, this crazy man, he obeyed God and God told him, do not be present for your wife's funeral because the wife is like Jerusalem. That means God is not going to mourn for us either. Just as Ezekiel didn't mourn for his wife, God will not mourn for Jerusalem. Okay, doctor, you have a question from Pastor Neil. Okay, how does prayer come in when God already has his plans for Well, we believe that prayer moves the hands of God. God has his plans. God knows. That's why in the sense the Bible talks about God for knows, God for ordain, and all this. Yes, God has his plan. But prayer can also move God's, God's hand to sometimes stay his plan. So many times when the people prayed and Moses prayed, God changed his mind. God stopped doing what he wanted. Remember, at one time, God wanted to destroy the people and forget about bringing the people to the promised land. Moses interceded and prayed. And God said, okay, for your sake, Moses, I will not do this. So prayer can come in. You see, prayer comes in to sometimes move the hands of God. So we believe that it's always a tension. On one hand, God knows the outcome of everything. But on the other hand, there's still a possibility that we can perhaps pray. Just like Abraham, the intercessor. You know, he prayed, if God, if we can find 100 people in these two cities, will you destroy? But notice he, he stopped at 10. Abraham didn't go down. See, if Abraham go down a bit more to five, the cities will be safe. Why? Because there will be Lord, his wife, the two daughters, and perhaps the two sons-in-law. And we at least six people, maybe then he'll be the cities could have been safe. But he stopped at 10 and he didn't ask anymore. And in the end, the cities were destroyed. <coughs> Yet one of the cities, Zoar, was allowed to survive because the Lord says. Can I flee to this little village, Zoa? Because it's too hard for me to run up the hills. Okay, you can go to Zoa. So out of the five cities in the plain, Zoa was safe from destruction. Sodom, Gomorrah, Zeboim, and one more city were all destroyed. Zoa. So intercession prayer can sometimes stay the hand of God. And God can, as the Bible says, change his mind, avert what you want to do. So it's possible for God to change. There are times when God says, even prayer will not move. Like in this case, in Ezekiel, the, the sins of the nation has been so great, the people will have to go to exile. Exile was like a period of cleansing of the land. You know, you know this exile? God takes the best people, the elite, out to Babylon. The land becomes like fellow. It's like a sabbatical year. The land lies fellow for 50 old years. And after that, the land is regenerated, the people come back now, then rebuild the nation. So God had to allow the exile to come in order to cleanse the land from all the pollution. So many years of the kings themselves leading the people astray, involved in idolatry, especially the sin of Manasseh. So in the end, Judah itself has to go to exile. So exile was like letting the land lie fallow and then then let it regenerate back its goodness, its fertility, and then the people come back from home and then rebuild back the, the nation. So sometimes God will say, no, judgment still must come. So prayer, yeah. Actually, yes. yeah. Sorry. Yeah. So we uh, can pray in the wrong way in the sense that we can pray against God's will, can't we? Sometimes yeah. We always pray in, you know, you have to pray in God's will in the name, right? according to the, the will of God. Because sometimes God allows the decision to be destroyed. Whatever prayer we pray cannot avert. Like this pandemic, we, we are not very sure how to pray. Uh, very often we say, God, please take away the pandemic, remove the virus. I uh, very suspicious of this prayer <laughs> well it's, it's hard to know most of the time you only know from hindsight when everything is over after that uh, but when it's going on sometimes we just don't have the benefit of hindsight it's like someone posted because of the U Russia Ukraine war someone posted in America and then it was quoted by a friend of mine and he says no 
the U- Russian Ukraine war is a time for rejoicing. Time for rejoicing. Why? Oh, because end times is coming. Oh. But you know, you're like rejoicing over war. Why should you rejoice over war? In war, so many people die. We should never rejoice when there's war. We should always moan. War means it's a failure of humanity. We can't sit down and talk and, uh, and work out something. We, we had to go and destroy one another. War is never good. I mean, for, for this Christian to write and say, oh, time to rejoice over the war. Why should you rejoice? I mean, on one hand, it may be a sign of the second coming. You rejoice at that, but not at, at the sign of, of war. War is bad. Uh, that was a sermon I tackled in uh, the Basel Church KK, the pre-recorded sermon. It's about uh, a Christian response to war. And I look at the Bible and I also look at early church tradition, people like Augustine uh, and uh, Thomas Aquinas, who created a, a, a theory called the just war theory to how to respond to war. And so the question is, is ever war just? Can war be just? Can you, can you, can you ever justify going to war? So they struggled with this issue and came up with some conditions. When can war be just? And when is war wrong? And I think it's something very useful for us to think about today in the context of war that's going on in, in the world. Can war ever be justified? Can there be wars that are right and wars that are wrong? Wars that are morally justified, more wars that are morally wrong at all counts. But it's not easy. See, we come from a tradition that praises Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a German theologian who took part in the conspiracy against Adolf Hitler. Now we will say, how can he? He was a scholar, a, a pastor. He took part in the conspiracy to actually assassinate. Adolf Hitler. But he took the view that if we allow a guy like Adolf Hitler to live, the longer he lives, more people will die. If he dies, then war can be averted, less people die. So he, well, he joined in that conspiracy. They actually brought a bomb into the bunker. The, the guy placed a bomb in a briefcase next to Hitler, but it was beside a table and when the bomb exploded, it did not kill Hitler, it only wounded him on the side. So he survived for another one and a half years. More people died in the war because Hitler continued to survive. Bonhoeffer was executed. Today we praise him, you see. But you see, it's very difficult. On the hand, you're, you're saying you, 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 you justify violence because for him it was like, like what the high priest said about Jesus, it is expedient for one man to die and then for the whole nation. Remember, that's what the high priest said about Jesus. We surrender this man to the Rome and kill him, and he'll be saved at least our whole nation. But it's very difficult. We are, we are not God. We, we can't away, and we don't have the hindsight to know what's the outcome. So on one hand, we praise Bonhoeffer for his courage, or whatever. But on the other hand, he's like saying, it's okay to, to sometimes take part in violence. So I threw that question to the church. You know, if, if Malaysia is invaded by a foreign power, let's say Indonesia, will you as a Christian take up arms and defend your nation? It's not an easy question to answer because many of us will say, well, we Christians are supposed to be non-violent, we are supposed to turn the other cheek. But, but I used to struggle with this also, but I say, are you going to sit back and do nothing and watch the enemy come and destroy your nation? and kill your family, and you just say, oh, I'm a Christian, I cannot take part in war. I think through the years, I struggle with this, I come to the point saying, no, I don't think I will sit down and do anything. If my nation is being invaded, I may have to take up arms to defend my family. So it's not easy, it's not easy thing to think about all these issues. Is ever war justified? Violence. And you read the Old Testament here, you have all these things about war and violence, and God uses, uses the sword of the Babylon. It's terrible, you know, Babylon was a cruel nation, and God used the sword of Babylon to pass, pass judgment upon the people. We can't escape this whole idea of violence. It's all there in the Bible. Even New Testament, we say, oh, Jesus is love, yeah? But as we always talk about revelation, there's a final war, Armageddon. <laughs> You know, you can't run away from war. War and violence are part and parcel somehow of religion and in the Bible. 
Maybe one day we can talk about that, that as an issue of war and violence in the Bible. How do we deal with such a difficult issue? It's not easy. Right, thank you so much. Yeah. Any other questions? You know, this is just part one. Huh? Part two of Ezekiel comes in September um, to be exact. It's 23rd September, am I right? Mm. 23rd September, we'll see you all again. Yeah, um, long week. Tomorrow, <laughs> he has a sermon on chapter 18. So thank you very much, Doctor, and thank you all for coming. Yeah, thank you, guys. If you have questions, you can uh, collect them and then maybe then email me uh, to the okay. church. Okay. Because, as I said, uh, if you have never read Ezekiel, there will be a lot of things in your mind. And uh, what I've done is only give you an outline. So, uh, but with the outline, you know, it's the, 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 the whole thing is recorded. So, you can actually go back and look at it. And with the outline, you actually literally work to the book. And even then, there will still be a lot of difficult issues, a lot of queries. It's never easy. Uh, hmm. Ezekiel is one of those prophets which... Uh, you know, you can get, as you say, sometimes tempted to uh, get diverted and you end up talking about the minor and not the major issue. So one has to keep focus on the book. And what's the, what's the main message behind this whole thing? Then you 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 see the, the message of Ezekiel. So I've never taught Ezekiel for a long time because it was a, not an easy book to grasp. But eventually this year I decided, well, I teach it in the church for eight weeks, forced myself to work through the whole thing. Then I told Billy I'm going to share in the, as well over two weekends to see how it works out as a shorter thing. And eventually I will be ready to teach it as a module for, for the seminary, a 30 credit hour module on ECQ. Because once you work through it, you can see the message now. It's, it's quite clear. 1 to 3, 4 to 24, 25 to 32, and then 33 to 39, 40 to 48. It's almost like in my mind already, built into my mind. So it's easy now to navigate to a boat like Ezekiel. You know what the message is. So today we have to think about his calling and all the oracles of judgment against his people, against the fallen nation. So in September, we will then look at oracles of hope, deliverance and salvation, all those visions about what God will do and then ends with that nine chapters of the new temple, a new a vision of a new temple. That will be the end of the book. Okay, so see you in okay, September so for part two. See you again. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Reverend. Thank you, brothers and sisters from Berea for joining us. Thank you. Yeah, Thank you so much.